Welcome to the Victory Garden. Today, Jim Wilson visits Seed Savers Exchange in Decorah, Iowa. Here, Kent Wheelie and company have taken on the mission of collecting and preserving heirloom vegetable seeds. Seeds that tell the history of gardening in America and have been passed down for generations from father to son and neighbor to neighbor. Varieties like Mayflower bean, Bloody Butcher corn, and Mandan winter squash. And back here, well, I'll be harvesting potatoes for Marion's recipe. All that and more is just ahead, so please, stay tuned. Funding for the Victory Garden is made possible by public television viewers. The American Rental Association, whose member businesses rent the tools and equipment to build a home, landscape it, grow a garden, and throw a party. Monrovia Nursery Company, producers of container-grown ornamental plants, available at nurseries and garden centers nationwide. And by Grace Sierra Horticultural Products Company, makers of Peter's professional plant foods and potting soils for all your indoor and outdoor gardening needs. Earlier this summer, Jim Wilson was in Iowa to visit Seed Savers Exchange. Here's his report. I greet you from Decorah, Iowa. It's in the northeast corner of the state, up where it touches Wisconsin and Minnesota. And unlike other farms in this area, which grow a single crop like corn, Heritage Farms grows a lot of different kinds of vegetables. This is the home of Seed Savers Exchange, and this is a group of concerned gardeners who want to grow and save seeds of old, old varieties called heirloom varieties so that they don't disappear from the face of the earth. And earlier today, I met with Kent Whaley, the director. Well, Kent, uh, how did you personally get into saving uh, seeds of heirloom vegetable varieties? In the early 1970s, uh, my wife and I had just moved to this cor northeast corner of Iowa, and her grandfather, a really honorary old fellow named Baptist Ott, gave us the seeds of three garden varieties that his family had brought over from Bavaria four generations before. Well, uh, doesn't every family have a, a grandfather who sows seeds in an overcoat lining and brings them from the old country? Well, there's uh, a tremendous heritage of that type of seeds in this country that's never been systematically collected. Uh, but uh, Diane's grandfather passed away that winter, and uh, we realized that if his seeds were to survive, that it was up to us. And uh, about that same time, we were uh, lucky enough to come across the writings of several geneticists who were trying to warn the public about the real dangers of genetic erosion. Genetic erosion? Now, what's that all about? Well, um, the majority of the vegetable varieties that are available to gardeners in this country um, are really in danger of being lost right now. Uh, many of the older gardeners, uh, um, people that live out in, out in the country, don't have uh, anyone to pass their seeds on to because so many of the young people have left the land yes. during the last couple of decades. There's also a tremendous amount of loss going on uh, within the commercial seed industry. A lot of varieties, just because of economic consolidation, but a lot of varieties are being dropped from catalogs right now. So how did you get started then in, in saving well, seeds? Well, we, um, this network that we've put together uh, has grown from uh, uh, six people that we were able to contact in uh, 15 years ago uh, into this uh, directory. Uh, we're a membership organization, a nonprofit uh, membership organization, um, and uh, every year we put out three publications for our members. Um, this winter yearbook comes out in January of each year, and it lists all of our members that are offering seeds. So uh, last year there were about 800 uh, people listed in, uh, in this yearbook and about 5,000 to 6,000 rare varieties of, uh, of garden vegetables that have never been available right. commercially. To, to bring it down to an, an example, say if uh, I wanted to order seeds of this um, big old purple bean here, how would I go about it? Well, this variety is called Louisiana Purple Pod, and it's an old uh, snap bean. And uh, so you'd, you'd look it up in the yearbook here under, under snap pole beans to see if I can find it. There it is, Louisiana Purple Pod. And uh, there are about a half a dozen of our members that are offering it. I, I can't read this code here. Do you want to tell me who I sure. would order seeds from? Well, we suggest that our members go to someone that's in a climate similar to their own. So probably Kentucky would, might be the closest to you of any of these sources. And uh, so you'd look up this code. Uh, in the front of the book, all of the members are arranged uh, alphabetically by state. 
So here he is. It's uh, John and Abnett uh, in Somerset, Kentucky. Okay, sure. um, and the way the yearbook uh, works is that uh, people who are who are listed in it that are offering seeds through the yearbook, they trade seeds just for postage. Uh, but someone like yourself, if, I joined, who, uh -huh. if, if you joined, you wouldn't be offering seeds yet through the yearbook, but you'd be able to order any of the seeds by sending a dollar for a sample that, to anyone that was listed. That's fair enough. Well, with all of these good people all over the country uh, growing and saving seeds, what's left for you to do? Well, we, cert we put out the publications, of course, uh, but most of the trading that goes on through the winter yearbook is fairly haphazard. Um, so there are various of our members, uh, the people that are the most active within the seed exchange, that have built up huge collections of various crops. Uh, they'll go through each winter yearbook and order everything that's available. Uh, so we've been putting together those types of collections here at the farm. Um, we've got uh, huge collections of beans and tomatoes and peppers and lettuce. So you actually plant them out then and save the yeah, seeds you, from them? Yeah, you have to plant out seeds every few years or they'll die, of course. Well, what uh, seed are you harvesting at this moment? We're just now beginning to take, uh, to take tomato seeds and uh, we'll start our bean harvest in about another week. But we've got some of the tomatoes that we're processing now if you'd like to see those. I sure would. Okay, let's go into the barn here. What a great barn. Is it as old as it looked? Well, it was built in 1929, and when we purchased the farm four years ago, it was in really poor repair. Uh, but we're really lucky to have a community of about 140 Amish families that live right north of here. Yes. And uh, so I've gotten to know a lot of those folks, and a uh, crew of Amish carpenters has completely redone the barn, as you can see. I bet every beam in this place is plumb and true. Oh, they're excellent craftsmen, just excellent. Well, you've got uh, all sorts of bulb crops spread out all over here. Uh, yes, these are, these are the ones that we've harvested so far. Potatoes of all colors over here, red and yellow and blue, and and some that, um, honest Pete, I'd throw these back. They just aren't <laughs> papers, are they? Well, this is a little potato that's called German salad, and uh, it's, um, it's a, what they call a fingerling potato, and it's yellow-fleshed and really firm, and they use it for traditional German potato salad. It's, so it's, this is as big as it gets? It is, and it's, if you ever tasted, you know, the delicious potato salad that they make out of it, that, you know, you might, uh, you might... I'd you'd never go back to red Well, you'd, yeah, you'd see why people have maintained a little potato for, for all of these years. Well, how about uh, these garlic varieties over here? You've got trays and trays of them. Uh, this one right here, tell me something about it. Well... This is the one I'm thinking about. Um, yeah, it was collected by a fellow named John Swenson who made a trip uh, with a, another group of scientists over to uh, uh, Gomokari Village uh, in uh, the state of Georgia in, in, uh, in southern USSR. Um, so this is, uh, this is a variety that's, uh, that's grown fairly widely over there, but it, as you can tell, it's... Yeah. It's, Pretty, not, it's uh, nothing for size. You know, this would never win any prizes out in Gilroy, California, where they have the garlic capital of the world. Yeah. But it's strong. Oh, it really... knock your socks off. <laughs> it really Ooh. is. Yeah, they're, they're very strong. But You know, not many people know how to grow garlic. It's really easy. Uh-huh. And it's easy to grow shallots like these right here. What is this variety? Well, this is one... It's the one I'm thinking of. It's called uh, Prince of Brittany. Uh, but it's, uh, it's so it comes from the province of Brittany in, in France. Yes, and it's fairly common over there, but it's an, it's an excellent shallot. $3.98 a pound. Well, everybody, everybody ought to grow them. You bet. <laughs> so you're not just restricting your saving to um, American varieties. Well, no, we're, we're interested in anything that isn't really available commercially in this country. You were talking to me about tomato seed. How do you go about yeah. saving them? Well, we're just uh, beginning our tomato harvest right now, so these are some of the first ones. Uh, but we wait until there are enough ripe fruits uh, to fill one of these deli tubs. I mean, to squeeze the juice and the seeds into, into one of these little tubs. And then we let it ferment for about, oh, three days. And that makes it acid. Yeah, it, um, well, actually, the, the fermentation process breaks down the little sacks of gel around each seed and destroy all of the seed-borne diseases. In How the do you get rid of all that juice, then? Well, we take these out to the sink, and we'll pour them through a sieve and wash them really well. And then we plop that out onto, well, just coffee filters. Uh, and that works really well to sort of wick the, wa the moisture away from the seeds, and they dry down really well that way. This is Ficarazzi. That's uh, an Italian variety. Yes, it is. It's in an excellent All right. Way. When you get them about half dried like that, what do you do with them? Well, at this point, when they're, when they're starting to get really fairly dry, um, we dry them on down with silica gel. 
Um, this is Beth Rotto, our seed librarian. Hi, Beth. Silica gel. Now, what? Well, it's here are some examples of it. When uh, when it's completely dry, uh, it has a, a coloring agent in it. Um, I think it's cobalt chloride. But uh, mm -hmm. this when it's blue, it's uh, it's completely dry, and as it picks up moisture, it's a desiccant, and so we seal the seeds away from it. And as the as it picks up moisture, uh, it turns uh, turns more and more toward uh, toward a light pink. But that draws the moisture out of the seeds over about a week period, mm -hmm. and then we then we heat seal the seeds into these uh, foil packets, and then the seeds are frozen, and that uh, increases their life by about ten times. So they wouldn't keep very well if you didn't dry them like that or freeze them. No, um, most seeds, of course, have to be regrown every uh, every few years yeah. or they'll die. All right, now the little seeds like that you put in freezers. How about corn and beans and peas? Well, and the, large seeds? the larger seeds uh, we dry. And store uh, in these uh, in these jars like this. Mm -hmm. So the this uh, this of course after they've been dried down, uh, this is an airtight container, of course. Do you have a bean bean variety that just reeks of history? Well, here's here's one that I know of. Do you have any relatives that came over on the Mayflower? Yeah, I do. William Brewster. Yeah. Well, most people do. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, this one was brought over by uh, a woman named Ann Hutchinson. Uh, and it's been grown in North Carolina and then here in Iowa by members of her family. And it's called Mayflower. Yeah, and it's been grown every few years, uh, at least for the last 300 years. That's precious seed. I'm going to cap that one up. <laughs> uh, I can see from all of these bottles and all these trays the size of the job that's uh, facing you. Now, you have to grow these. Who's in charge of that? Well, we are lucky to have a really excellent crew of, of folks here who are helping us uh, maintain our collections of seeds. And uh, I'd like to introduce you to David Cavignaro, who's uh, kind of chomping at the bit to show you some of the grow outs yeah, we have going here. Let's do that. All right. Hi, David. Jim, hi. Ken Whaley tells me you won't mind if I interrupt your corn pollination here a little bit. Not a bit. Not What's a this bit. variety? It's a real tree topper. Well, isn't this a tall one? This is an old um, heirloom flint corn called Bloody Butcher. Obviously a tall one that's still being grown in some parts of the country. Why would they give it a name like Bloody Butcher? Well, it has the most beautiful blood red kernels you ever did see. Well, what did they use it for? Well, it's a, it's a good field corn, first of all. Excellent stock feed. Um, it has as many as four ears per stalk. So it's a productive one, but then it makes a real good um, cornmeal corn, a like red any cornmeal. like, like red like cornmeal, like any flint corn. You can grind it for cornmeal. Well, how do you go about saving the seed? Well, the first thing and the reason for all these bags uh, and pollen collection is that, as you know, corn is wind pollinated, and it has uh, it has the male flowers up in the tassel, and then the female flowers. Um, um, here on the, uh, the silks, the silks mm -hmm. on, the, on the cob. So since we're growing about 30 varieties of corn in this patch, they'd readily be crossed by the wind. In order to make sure we get pure seed of all of these varieties grown in a tight spot, we have to hand pollinate, collect all the pollen uh, from the tassels each day, mix it all together in a bag. Oh, and that gives you a representative and, uh, sample and, and from all the plants. Yeah. Hold this for me. All right. I have a bag full of pollen I've already collected from down the row. If you just pour that in here. We'll get a good mixture of pollen. And we mix it all together to make sure we have as complete a genetic sample of this row of corn as we can. Then what? Well, then the next thing is to take off the bag that has been protecting these silks since yesterday when we first trimmed this ear and made it ready. There hadn't been any silks out yesterday. This all came out overnight, so these right. have had no pollen on them yet. And then we, um, we make sure to douse this as thoroughly as we can with pollen, shake it in good. Put this back on right Well, quick. let's put this brown one back on. OK. Because the brown bag then um, marks that ear as having been pollinated. We staple that on there, and it stays on until harvest. That'll keep other foreign and that pollen keeps, out of it. keeps there. foreign pollen off and uh, as well marks the bag. Then in the fall, we go down the row, collect all the ears that uh, we know are pure. Good and dry by then. As dry as we can in the field, complete the drying process as you saw in the barn, and then we're done. All right, now are you sure that when you plant that seed next year that you're going to get bloody butcher from it? Well, if we've been careful and haven't gotten any foreign pollen in the process, 
we're sure. <laughs> well, I'm starting to understand about how you save the uh, corn seed, but um, how about some other kinds of seed? Well, I'm about to do some hand pollination of squash to keep those pure. Would you like to see how that goes? You bet. Okay. Well, David, you got a little bit of everything here, bits and pieces from the whole vegetable kingdom, it looks like. Well, Jim, actually, that's our problem. If we were like an ordinary farmer and had just a field of all one crop, we wouldn't have to worry about keeping the variety pure. But we're growing 1,500 varieties of a whole bunch of different crops. So we have to develop all kinds of strategies to keep these things from cross-pollinating. All right, for example, uh, how do you keep this carrot from cross-pollinating? Well, carrots are pollinated by flies and, and bees, primarily. Um, and therefore, any other carrot within probably a half a mile of here would readily cross with this, would be crossed by those flying insects. The simplest way to, cross, uh, to keep carrots from crossing is to just grow them in isolation, have only one only variety. Only one variety, yeah. And then, therefore, we don't have to protect them at all from insects. Well, I'm sure a lot of people have never seen carrots going to seed before, David. You've got some... Funny looking cages up here. Well, the what are you growing in here? The cages are covering our pepper varieties, Jim. And, and um, unlike, unlike carrots, which, um, which must have bees and flies to pollinate them, peppers will actually self-pollinate on their own, mm -hmm. although insects will readily cross them if they have access. So all we have to do to keep peppers pure is to simply put a cage over them and leave it there till harvest, and we know that everything inside is kept absolutely pure. Oh, yeah. Now, you've got... A little bit of this and a little bit of that along this row with tomatoes and uh, what looks like a giant uh, soybean here mm -hmm. and another different variety of tomatoes and then lettuce in a form that most people wouldn't recognize when it's going to seed. Again, this is another strategy for helping to dis discourage crossing. Tomatoes and beans are largely self-pollinating, but there's a small incidence of crossing. So we outsmart the bees by breaking up the row by alternating yeah. crops and, and discouraging insects from moving down the row. Uh, lettuces are largely self-pollinating, but they require about a 25-foot isolation. So we hide them down in between the pole rows and therefore fool the bees a little that way. <laughs> <laughs> now, you were talking about uh, squash uh, earlier. Uh, you've got a great big field of it here. What's this variety? This is an old Indian winter squash variety called Mandan. Um, and it's true, this is all one variety, but we have other squash growing in the garden in other places. And so to ensure that the bees don't move pollen from one variety to another, we actually hand pollinate these, Jim. Um, we, um, the night before, yesterday night. evening, last night, I came out and put this piece of tape on the end of this female flower. Like the corn we saw earlier, um, squash have male and female flowers. But so the, last night this actually hadn't opened? No, we, we, we look for flowers that have just turned a little bit yellow and are ready to open the next right. morning, put a piece of tape on them, and uh, that ensures that no bees will have gotten in there this morning. And how do you know that's a female? Well, right below the blossom itself is a, is a little forming squash. Yeah. And, uh, and that's how we can tell. All right, now where are you going to get the pollen from? Well, we have to first go look for some male flowers. Last night... When I came out uh, taping the female blossoms, I also hunted around through the patch and found some, some males. There's one right in here. See, so yeah. I put a little piece of tape on the leaf right. to tell me where it was. And you're going to pick it. Well, I'm going to pick that. Now, you can see there's no squash at the yeah. base of that. Yeah. You see, it's just a blossom on a stem. So then we're going to take this right on over. All right now, um, how many fruits do you save from a big patch like this to get a representative sample? We like to save, um, oh, two, three, four fruits maybe, and have used various males off of other plants as well. So we have a sample of maybe eight or ten yeah. plants represented. All right, now how are you going to do this? Okay, the first thing I'm going to do is, is take the um, tip off that flower and then open this up. And down inside, you see that that oh, soft, fuzzy, yeah, that's yeah. the female part of the flower called the stigma. And that's the place that receives the pollen. And the next thing we do is simply open this flower up and actually take off all of the petal of the flower. And see that little... Oh, I can see it. It's just a paintbrush a absolutely pollen. full of pollen. All right. 
And then we play B here, and we go inside, and we simply brush that all over the female part of the flower. You know, when, when home gardeners have trouble with squash-setting fruit, they might use the same technique. That's right. If, if you're short on bees at, early in the season, sometimes, for instance, it's very easy to hand-pollinate your squash to make sure they're getting... Pollinated. How are you going to keep this from crossing? Okay, we have to then tape this back closed, because at any time now, bees could come in and, um, and interfere with the work we've done by adding pollen from another variety. So all we have to do is use the blossom itself as a little package, tape it closed, and then the last act is to take a bright orange marker like this, a piece of plastic tape, and tie it around the stem to make sure that we know in the fall harvest time that that's the one right. to pick. So then when that rind is good and hard, you'll come out and pick these and cut them open and save the and seed. And save the seed. Yeah. David, I want to thank you very much for showing us your operation here. You're doing very important work, and I'm sure the gardeners everywhere appreciate it. Thank you, Jim. Well, Kent, up here in the top of the barn, and this used to be the hayloft, I don't see a single bale of hay. What's going on here? Uh, one of the Amish fellows, after they completely uh, remodeled this uh, part of the barn, uh, asked me if I was going to fill it with hay, and I told him, no, I was going to fill it with people. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you mean by filling it with people? Well, Jim, more than anything, uh, Seed Savers is an organization of people. And so we uh, try to bring in a... Uh, our members at every opportunity. Um, we've uh, started developing a series of celebrations. Each spring we now have a wildflower festival uh, because the valley floor and the slopes of the valley are just simply covered with wildflowers each spring. And then we have a camp out convention in uh, July uh, where 200, 250 of our members come together for a camping weekend and we have speeches and slideshows and they swap seeds and uh, that's usually when the gardens are about at their peak. Uh, and then we've also started having a pumpkin carving celebration where uh, the kids within our organization, you know, young and old, can get together for, for a wonderful celebration. So they're coming in from all over the country, and it would be a real shame if you didn't use this great old halo for a barn dance. Well, we'd have barn dances in conjunction with most of our celebrations. Great. Uh, Cele celebrations. I like uh, that word. Uh, um, Kent, you've got everything pretty well under control here now with your network. But what does the future hold for Seed Savers Exchange? Well, we would certainly like to continue to, uh, to have our members explore and uh, try to collect and maintain all of the heirloom varieties that we can find within the, the country. Um, but we're also branching out into some other areas as well. Uh, just this spring, we've planted what we call our historic apple orchard that will eventually include about 600 old-time apples. Uh, plus, we're also uh, uh, working with rare breeds of livestock and poultry as well. So. Essentially, what we're trying to do is to develop a living museum of historic varieties where we can bring our members in and other folks that are interested as well and, and show them what is actually their heritage as vegetable gardeners in this country. Well, you're doing a great job with it, Kim. Well, and um, I want to tell you how much I thank you for uh, taking us through. Well, but now, listen, are you going to invite me when you have your next barn dance? Certainly, certainly. Uh, you better be here. <laughs> well, it's wonderful having you here. If you would like more information on Seed Savers Exchange, just write to them at Decorah, Iowa. What a wonderful project. Well, back here, Marion has put out the call for potatoes. I think I can get her exactly what she wants. Those look good to me. What could be more ordinary than mashed potatoes? Well, not this version that I'm going to make today. It's mashed potatoes with loads of garlic and brown onion. You're looking at two pounds of potatoes that I've peeled and cut up, and I'm going to bring them to a boil and let them cook until they're just tender. Now, while the potatoes are cooking, I want to make a delicious garlic butter, and I started out with a great big head of garlic, and I broke it into cloves, and then I peeled the cloves, and then chopped the cloves into little dice, and I sprinkle that with a little bit of salt and then work it with the back of my knife. And this will turn the garlic into a lovely, smooth puree. There. That's quite a bit of pureed garlic. And I'm going to beat that into three tablespoons of softened butter and set it aside. Well, 
Well, that fork goes in nice and easily. These potatoes are ready. Okay, to the sink. And drain them and put them right back in their pot. I'm going to return them to the heat just long enough to evaporate any extra moisture. That'll just take about a minute. There. Now, the potatoes go into my big mixer, and I'm going to use a wire whisk, which will help the smoothness of beating these potatoes. I'm going to start that off at a low speed. Okay, now I can add my garlic butter. And then I'm going to slowly add about a half a cup of warm milk. And now I'm going to turn this up and let it whip. Okay, now the potatoes go back into that same pot they cooked in. And I'm going to take them over to the stove and reheat them and season them with salt and pepper. And while I do that, I'm also going to heat some onions, about a cup of chopped onions and some butter, and brown those up. And here is how we serve garlic mashed potatoes with brown onions. Nothing ordinary about this dish. Thanks, Marion, and thanks to all of you for being with us today. And be sure to join us next time when Peter Seabrook visits the beautiful bulb fields of Holland. Until then, this is Bob Thompson from the Victory Garden. Funding for the Victory Garden is made possible by public television viewers. The American Rental Association, whose member businesses rent the tools and equipment to build a home, landscape it, grow a garden, and throw a party. Monrovia Nursery Company, producers of container-grown ornamental plants, available at nurseries and garden centers nationwide. And by Grace Sierra Horticultural Products Company, makers of Osmocote time-release plant foods for all your outdoor and indoor plants. Bob Thompson, welcome to the Victory Guide.